after independence, when you know it's up to the Congo to decide who can come there, uh, you had the CIA, as I mentioned. You did have um, MI6. There's this uh, British spy, a woman named Daphne Park, whose life is fascinating. Um, she was there. What was what? what let's take that tangent right there. What, what's so fascinating about <laughs> There's her? There's a a book about her called Queen of Spies, but um, she was this sort of legendary British spy and and a woman at a in in a field that was dominated by men, you know, way ahead of her time, and also very, you know, um, daring and and uh, witty and yeah, a whole. Um, larger than life figure. What was her like, I mean, obviously I didn't write the book, but what was her like claim to fame as a spy? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure the answer to that question. She was in Congo. I know I kind of wasn't looking at what she did afterwards. Um, but, uh, she, uh, she also exaggerated a lot and it's you know, sometimes hard to tell right. with her what was, um, fact and what was fiction. Don't you hate that shit? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it came up a lot in researching yeah. this book, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then the KGB was, did have a small presence in Congo. The Americans thought it was much bigger than it ended up being. And, you know, with the opening of the Soviet archives, one thing that's that became clear was that Moscow viewed the Congo not as this, you know, important area where it could gain a toehold in Africa, but as this sort of peripheral, peripheral concern where it could, you know, score some propaganda points, but it wasn't ever going to be able to compete with the West there. But at the time, the Americans were paranoid and thought that, you know, they were seeing Soviet ghosts everywhere. So I take it the GDP out of this place, even with their resources, wasn't, wasn't something to jump at. It seems yeah, that way. That, that's, I'd say that's accurate. It was, um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the Sources I was reading would talk about how the Congo was this massive, strategically important country in the heart of Africa. And in some sense, that is true. On the other hand, I think at the end of the day, it was not a particularly high or should not have been a particularly high strategic priority for the United States. Um, it, And yet the United States got way more involved than right. um, it needed to. Is, is also part of that the fact that, like, a lot of the country is covered by uncharted rainforest? You know, like, it. so it's not – I mean, I'm not familiar with what it looks like on the ground there today or, or what it did. But it would seem to me that you have segments of the country that are, like, open outside the rainforest and then a lot of the country covered by that. So it's also kind of spread out. It's not like this kind of centralized, you know, one province type place. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, it's a massive – country that um it almost you know doesn't make it, it you wouldn't design it as a country today it, the, it's you know got grouping together all sorts of different ethnic groups the geography varies on a continental scale there are mountains snow-capped mountains and rainforest and savannah um and it's yeah it's the size of western europe mm. 80 times larger than belgium it's 80 times yeah. larger than belgium that's a scary thought. And they were able to go colonize that thing. It's wild how that happened. That's like a part of history. Like, as I said, it's, we all know it happened, but it's like this thing like, oh yeah, Africa got colonized. And it's like snap of the finger type history. But it's insane to me how easily some of that happened and how, you know, the, the indignance and entitlement to go in there and, and be like, well, this is ours now. I, I, I just will never get over that, but yeah. human beings are, are funny. So anyway, back to Lumumba, though. So he's participating in these conferences as we laid out. He's becoming a clear leader. A lot of the prospective leadership are obviously native people from Congo who were raised under the restrictive rule. Maybe they're not as educated as other leaders would be around the world because it wasn't allowed to them, but he's able to rise up through this. He's clearly a smart guy. What, like, what did his, what made people within the country gravitate towards him? And like, we laid out already that there were other countries around Africa who were seeking freedom at this time and successfully doing it. So that drives a lot of emotion within the country be like, well, we want to be out of this too. But like what made, what made the people say, okay, th th this is the guy, this is the guy we're looking up to. Yeah. So there are a few factors. I mean, one, he was a 
real organizational whiz. He just knew how to in, register voters, distribute propaganda, you know, campaign literature. He was extremely efficient and talented at that because he had, you know, been active in all sorts of associations and was just a very skilled political organizer. So that's one thing. Um, two, I think um, people found his message appealing in that he was, um, many other politicians were um, sort of playing ethnic politics and trying to, you know, divide, uh, divide the Congolese. He was promoting a message of unity saying, you know, we come from many different ethnic groups, but we all are Congolese and we need to become independent as one single country together. But I think the most important factor was his charisma. You know, mm. everyone um, who heard him could not help but remark at how charismatic he was. Even his enemies, even, you know, the U.S. ambassador who hated him would like to say that if you know, Lumumba had walked into a restaurant as waiter, he would have walked out as prime minister because he was just so convincing and charismatic. Um, so he really had a way of speaking to people, um, interlacing his arguments with sort of uh, logical, rational argumentation and impassioned you know, calls to action. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, uh, he became the most, you know, the politician that won the most votes when they had a parliamentary election just before independence. And then was that their first election, like was, since Belgian rule? First ever, yeah. How did that come to be? Like, so the Belgians, I guess, like signed off on them doing that? Yeah. So when the Belgians, at a certain point, very belatedly, they realized they had to give up control of the Congo, that, that, there was too great a risk of some sort of Algeria-style war. So they have this conference with the Congolese in Belgium where they negotiate the, you know, how independence is going to work. And so there are elections in May of 1960, independence is in June, and Congolese for the first time ever are allowed to, you know, pick who will represent them at a national level. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.